I'm definitely more of an anime type weed, but I have read a good chunk of manga in my day. Mostly shonen, but still enough to understand the language of the medium and the principles of design that underpin it, and to appreciate both excellence and innovation in craft when I see it. I can articulate why Dragon Ball and Bleach are masterclasses in the art of layout, what makes OG One Punch Man and Mob Psycho 100 so eminently readable despite looking, you know, like this, and how Tatsuki Fujimoto breaks and redefines the rules without compromising the legibility of his stories. So when I tell you that Witch Hat Atelier is the most technically impressive, boundary-pushing example of the art form that I have ever read, you should take that with a pinch of salt, but only a very small one. At some point between now and next year, if you haven't seen it already, you're gonna take a look at the Witch Hat Atelier anime trailer and think, God damn, I should watch that. Oh, hey, look, it happened right now. And you are absolutely correct to be thinking that. Bug films may only have one other anime under their belt, but that anime is ZOM 100 Bucket List of the Dead, the most based anime of 2023, so that's a hell of a pedigree. And with the director of Comey Can't Communicate, Summertime Rendering, After the Rain, Space Brothers, and Ace Attorney at the helm, I would be shocked if they can't keep the quality of that trailer up to create one of the the greatest fantasy anime of all time. However, if you're thinking, I need to wait to watch that blind, let me stop you right there, buddy. You absolutely do not need to wait, and what's more, you shouldn't. While I have zero doubts that Witch Hat Atelier can and will be adapted into an absolutely banging 10 out of 10 masterpiece, even if it reaches those heights, even if it surpasses them somehow, it will never be as good an anime as it is a manga. It's just not physically possible, because Witch Hat Atelier is a love letter to the art of illustration utterly inseparable from the medium that birthed it. One where every turn of every page threatens to reveal a new and delightful experiment in format rendered with the precise penswomanship of a practiced master. So even if they can replicate and animate every last panel's worth of artwork to perfection, half the manga's magic will still be left behind on the page in the space between those panels and the borders around them. Maybe it sounds like I'm exaggerating, so let me show you something that'll prove I'm not. This is not a cover page or a random cool art spread that was done just because. It's a prime example of Witch Hat Atelier telling its story with every tool available. A visual representation of how these girls feel stepping into a festival they've only read and heard about to this point in their lives. And it's immediately followed by a beautiful depiction of the very storybooks they read about the festival in, the first page of which we can spy under this spread's upturned corner. Fourth wall gags in manga are nothing new, just look at Dr. Slump, but the way Witch Hat uses this specific one to evoke feelings of wonder and whimsy without actually breaking our belief in its beautifully built up world, which I will be making a video on when that anime comes out, mark my words, that is new and innovative, and it's not used cheaply either. This spread appears a dozen volumes in, and there's nothing else quite like it in the entire series. Though Shirahama does frequently have characters lean on and out of panel borders to less dramatic degrees, but she also manages to do something almost as uniquely impressive as that spread at least once a chapter. From blending the formatting of manga with the aesthetics of illustrated manuscripts, to calculating the precise placement of sound effects and angled panels required to capture the kinetic energy of a Studio Ghibli flight scene in still black and white images when Coco casts her first self-made spell, to 
man, there's just too many examples to count. A certain character in the story is obsessed with that warm, bubbly feeling you get when you see something truly new and fun. And this manga is just full of those moments, each one somehow existing in simultaneous service of the plot and, most importantly, characters, while just being one of the coolest things you've ever seen. It's a story built on the understanding that drawing is a kind of magic in and of itself that proves that time and again with every single chapter. And, and that's about all I can say without slightly spoiling at least the first chapter slash episode. So if what I've said and shown you already is enough to grab your attention, just hit the like button, pretty please, to offset the damage I'm doing to my retention stats right now, then go read it already. I personally recommend the Bookwalker version if you're too impatient to wait for a physical copy in the mail. They got super high-res scans to let you fully appreciate all the cross-hatching and detailing in the artwork, and you can use promo code BASEMENT for a little discount. Though, even if it's gonna get me less coupon uses, I do have to say there is something especially magical about seeing all these clever illustrated tricks on real paper. Okay, if you're still here, I'm assuming you're down to hear descriptions of the general plot and overall premise of Witch Hat Atelier, so here goes. The story is all about this little girl named Coco, the ordinary daughter of an ordinary seamstress born into a world where magic is real. However, despite Coco's ceaseless dreams of using it herself, that magic is the exclusive inborn domain of witches, a secretive sect of pointy-hatted scholars born with this power to reshape reality. And tragically, Coco does not have the gift, so all she can do is marvel at the few magical tools that pass through her backwater village and dream about casting all the spells in her favorite storybook. That is, until a handsome witch happens to stumble into her humble home and inadvertently reveals the secret that suddenly makes all her dreams real. Magic isn't some innate and inexplicable arcane power. It's a system of hand-drawn runes and sigils that anyone can use so long as they have steady hands and a pot of magic ink handy. And her favorite book isn't just a story, it's a spell book in disguise, with magic circles and sigils hiding in plain sight on every page amid the artwork. When curiosity pushes her to trace those spells, though, that dream swiftly turns into a nightmare when the forbidden spell she didn't know she was casting swallows up her home and turns her mother to stone. As it turns out, the witches have a pretty darn good reason for all the secrecy and deception, not unlike the reasons the Hunter Guild keeps Nen secret. The knowledge that literally anyone can reshape reality with the flick of a pen is pretty darn dangerous in the wrong hands. And even in the right ones, it needs to be carefully controlled, lest mankind repeat the atrocities and abominations of the Age of Magic, when every king was a sorcerer and every man could create his own monsters. So all witches are sworn to help the unknowing with their magic, to avoid using their powers for causes of politics or war, and above all else, to never cast a spell that transmutes or transposes the flesh, be it teleportation, transformation, or even healing magic, save for exactly one spell used to erase all traces of magic from a person's memory in order to protect the secret, which Quifri, the witch Coco spied on to learn that secret, opts not to use on her, instead taking her in as a new apprentice so she might learn to cast spells the right way and hopefully one day free her mother from that prison of stone. Much of the manga, as the title suggests, concerns itself with Coco and her fellow apprentices chilling and studying spells in the comfort of Quifri's cozy-ass atelier, exploring the girls' clashing yet complementary personalities and approaches to making magic in a laid-back, 
slice of lifey sort of way. But of course, it is the life of witches being sliced, so those cozy moments frequently dovetail with exciting adventures and dives into deep magic lore, which often challenge not just the girls' spellcasting skills, but their whole philosophical outlook. As you might have surmised from the fact that healing magic is illegal in this world, the principles upholding which society are far from perfect. The even more secretive coven of brim-hatted witches who gave Coco that spellbook and seek to one day bring back the old, forbidden, or as they call it, free magic, despite their generally bad vibes, have some genuinely good points about how, like, society is run and junk, and even as Coco and her fellow apprentices oppose their efforts to do bad magic stuff, they also keep butting heads with magic cops and stumbling into heart-wrenching inequities born from the ancient decree that only some people get to be special and magical in this world. With Coco herself as a former unknowing outsider living as proof that good things can come from bending or even breaking those rules. And even within the witching world, there are haves and have-nots. People who benefit from the concentration and obfuscation of power, and people pushed to the margins by a rigid society that just wasn't built with them in mind. Though the potential dangers of unchecked magic are also made crystal clear time and again, and in response to all this input, we see in the kids a slowly brewing new synthesis of ideas between the pointed and brimmed caps ideals, between free and safe magic. And speaking as a world-building nut, I love that the series is as interested in exploring those socio-political ideas as it is cursed caves and dungeons containing dragons. Though it has plenty of that good classic fantasy shit too, don't get me wrong. In fact, its magic system is far and away one of the best in any manga I've read, or book for that matter, quite possibly as good as Hunter x Hunter's Nen, if not, dare I say it, better? It does have a similarly straightforward yet deceptively complex logic behind it. Rune dictates spell type, glyph placement, direction, and size dictate the spell's shape and function, and the circle around it all binds the spell and brings it to life. Yet from those simple rules sprout infinite imaginative possibilities, which the characters play around with in the manga, and the reader is gently encouraged to contemplate outside of it, dreaming up new witch hat designs and magic circles of their very own. A lot like Nen, except instead of making a mess with a glass of water and running around shouting attack names at your friends, Witch Hat Atelier simply makes you want to draw. Were it not a seinen title, I could see this manga inspiring a lot of young artists. Some of the early bonus chapters and pages even have sort of kids' activity book vibes to encourage exactly that. Though, I suppose there's nothing stopping kids from picking up these Tonko Bonds, or adults from picking up a new hobby, for that matter. The story revels in the hard-won joy of improving your art bit by bit, line by line, day by day, in a way that is impossible not to feel inspired by, and it really hammers home the idea that anyone can make magic with patience, practice, paper, and a pen. A philosophy it proves time and again with every bubbly, delightful turn of the page. So yes, absolutely go watch this anime the second it is out, but don't skip out on the manga in the meanwhile. They gave this thing an Eisner Award for a reason. Anyway, thanks for stopping by to watch my little manga review. Uh, if you're not subscribed to Basement Life already, please do, because I'm going to be doing more stuff like this, more stuff with me and Yazzie. We got some really cool things planned now that we're living in Japan when we go back. Just trust me, you're going to want to be subbed.